previously on what happened to B&M. Say I love me some Diamondback, but if it was designed with that same cocaine that Bulliger was sniffing when he made Kumba, you would have been kumbayaing over each and every hill. What are these eras of forcefulness with B&M and why do they exist? I decided to divide the eras of forcefulness by the years um, to see if there are similarities with the designs, the layouts, and how intense they are. The Mad Scientist Era, 1990 through 1997. The Millennium Force Era, 1998 through 2006. Floaters get a life vest, 2007 through today. But what really prompted these changes? I decided to explore some of the accident reports for B&M coasters for any explicit causes. Most reports were of guests crossing restricted areas including a handful of injuries and deaths, usually by inverts. There are a few employee mishaps with employees in restricted areas at the wrong unsafe time. There was an injury in the station of Flight Deck in California's Great America. Also, a ride op was injured during the dropping floor of a floorless coaster. But none of these truly explain why the intensity or the track or the train designs would be changed. Dragon Challenge, or Dueling Dragons, featured some heat when loose articles injured riders during some of the interactive moments of the coaster, causing the coasters to never duel again. And this was prior to its untimely closure in 2017. The most interesting would be that a 48-year-old man suffered a heart attack on a later Millennium Force era inverted coaster, Black Mamba. Later inspections suggested all safety features were sound and passed extensive testing. Therefore, either the rider had a pre-existing condition that was not disclosed or known, or the ride itself was just too intense, or a combination of both. This was the first and only incident of this sort that I could find with B&M, which could have damaged their squeaky clean track record for being such a reliable company, especially during the time when Intamin's reliability was diminishing in the States. This incident may have contributed to the substantial lowering of force for floater get a life vest B&M coasters. This incident occurred in 2011, and it was for a coaster which was built in 2006. However, this would suggest that this change really happened post-2012, which very well may mean that really floaters get a life vest era would be 2012 and on, and then the millennium era would be 1998 through 2011. Thus, wing coasters such as Raptor should be a little more intense than the other wings that followed, including X-Flight, Wild Eagle, Thunderbird, and Gatekeeper. I, I actually don't know. I'm asking y'all because I never rode Rafter. <laughs> you would think Banshee and Osiris would be substantially less intense than Black Mamba, which could be true. Griffin should be clearly more intense than Val Raven. Werner Stangle and Stangle Engineering, master coaster designer, was very influential in many of the earlier B&M roller coasters and has not been for many of the more recent coasters. Basically after 2004 and on, there are also general industry changes. Large arrow looping coasters were getting roasted on, like going to a black high school wearing some Payless shoes. When they were first built, people loved them, feeling like if we want great thrills, they will come with the pain. Arrow was legit a toxic partner in an abusive relationship. But through the mid 90s, enthusiasts and riders realized with such coasters like Magnum and Morgan Hypers, like Wild Thing and Still Force, they can still be big and thrilling without our heads being toyed with like some noodles being eaten aggressively with chopsticks. Specifically, the stories of Still Phantom becoming Phantom's Revenge and Drakenfire closing may be some of the most influential coaster narratives for BM. Opening in 1991, Still Phantom was a hyper coaster at Kennywood that inverted riders four times in the second half of the coaster. Riders were infatuated with the first half of the ride, but when that vertical loop hit, riders were like, Kennywood, you got me all the way fucked up. Phantom, you is acting up. Act up, you can get snatched up. But for real, Phantom was that real ass bitch who could give a fuck about it. And the riders' asses were getting snatched, like an Amy Schumer movie that was just terrible. 
Those trains racing up to 80 miles per hour going through those tightly engineered inversions regardless of the amount of trims that they placed on those tracks was ridiculous. At one point that lead up to the vertical loop was so trim the bitch was bald. Ain't nothing these trims could do at this point. What do you want me to trim your skull? b and began working on Kumba. They were like, yeah, nah, let's expand these loops. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna have us over here giving people concussions, not today. And when Drakenfire opened in 92, b and was scoping with they petty ass to find out how guests liked it. Guests came stumbling out of that thing on some, I knew I should have been the most, and jumped at the entrance of the queue on some, Corkscrew Coaster 1 is too intense for me. Just looking at Drakenfire makes me sick. Can you imagine some of their complaints? That thing play a hot potato in my head. I didn't know I was signed up to be a maraca. I came on as Nell and came off as a bit neck lady. It wasn't just complaints, there were reported injuries and even a lawsuit. b &M was like, I told you to expand those loops. Your loops is too tight. Arrow was like, hmm, well, how did you make your designs? And then b and was like, <laughs> that's funny. You're going to have to figure that out yourself. b and ain't shit. And they petty ass would be the ones that make Alpengeist a few years later with similar elements, just inverted this time, making ridership disappear completely on Drakenfire and having the ride close the next year. Back to Still Phantom, when B&M began to dabble with hyper coasters, they intentionally left out their notable inversions and focused on airtime, something that they were not really masters in. Uh-uh, not us. Interestingly, a couple of years later, Still Phantom became an airtime focused hypercoaster as Phantom Revenge. They also came complete with lap bar trains. Many coaster designers were pushing for lap bars and more freedom within your seats. In fact, B&M reworked the Still Dragon 2000s trains to be more free like their Hyper and Giga coaster trains. Also, the massive and intense RMC coasters use only a lap bar to restrain riders through their diverse and inverting elements. Their other top competitors, Intamin, reworked their bulkier over-the-shoulder restraints on their intense coasters. And this may have pushed for lap bars and less head banging. However, coasters without a track below them and going through prolonged vertical and hang time moments would probably need additional restraints. Probably. Hence the vests. However, why now when Premier Rides switch their over the shoulder restraints to lap bars on their coasters that invert? And this was all the way back in 2001. Outside of hazards, it could be the influence of top coasters at the time. In 1998, Amusement Today magazine began the Golden Ticket Awards. Back with the credible source of the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions, IAFA. This was during the era directly between the Mad Scientist era and the Millennium Force era, hence the Millennium Force era. Could the Golden Ticket Awards be one of the most significant reasons to why B&M started to do a little less forceful coasters? In 1998, the nine-year-old out and back hypercoaster Magnum XL200 won for best still coaster. In 1999, B&M debuts their first two hyper coasters, Raging Bull and Apollo's Chariot. Apollo's Chariot being out and back at Busch Gardens, Williamsburg. Not only that, but Magnum beat out Alpengeist, which was the inverted coaster at Busch Gardens, Williamsburg, which was number two on the Golden Ticket Awards. Montu was number three, Kumba was number four, and Raptor at Cedar Point was number six. Also interestingly, Number five and seven was Still Force and Mamba, both out and back hyper coasters by Morgan. And number eight was Desperado, an aero hyper coaster. Later in 2001, B&M debuted Nitro, another out and back hyper coaster, reaching the number four spot. However, this argument's kind of backwards when you think about newer age inverted coasters and sit down coasters. As Montu, Alpengeist, Raptor and Kumba consistently made the list, as well as a few other choice coasters such as Medusa slash Bizarro and Krypton Coaster, why would B&M not continue to pull out in tight, intense looping coasters? 
And there is a clear preference for non-inverting hypercoasters in the golden ticket listings, which may not clearly represent true preferences, as these inverted coasters may be legacy coasters. As in, people love them for so many years, and so they're going to continue to rate them high. There could be many reasons why, but these are just theories. It could be that park guests may send things to the parks about how they had stresses on certain coasters. This is like outside of the public viewing. It could be that these older coasters had more stress on the tracks and the trains, and it makes sense to reduce those stresses so that you can have a more durable, long-lasting coaster. But I think the most likely reason of all is that B&M's heart became two sizes too small. But no, they probably just got clean off the coke. How do I feel this good so So looking to the future, will this be how what today's intense coaster designer RMC becomes? Are there just like regular waves that happen in coaster manufacturing where there's waves of more subtlety and aggression and force and there's other also waves that are more forceful? Today it seems like we're in a resurgence of force. Please comment below, hit that thumbs up, share this, please. I'm Rob from Rob's Rides, keeping it 100 with all things amusement. And if you thought I was Coaster Rider, hit subscribe and I'll come back with a new video soon.